Welcome everybody to this event, a great debate, so I'm very happy that there is a very strong participation. The time is very short, so let me give a very short introduction together with Charlotte. Me and Charlotte are the conveners of this event. And uh, there is a, a, a panel of four panelists here, four scientists, two scientists indeed, and two people coming from the world uh, that uses the information coming from science. So the panelists are uh, written here, Massimo Cocco from INGV, Bruno Merz from GFZ, Peter Billing coming from European Commission, Gero Michael coming from the insurance world. And uh, I leave the, 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 the flow immediately to them, but just to tell that uh, we hope really that this debate could, could be quite alive, and I'm sure that it will be. The idea is that they start five minutes each, more or less, and then after 15, 20 minutes, let me say, uh, we, uh, we will uh, give the, the floor to you. Everybody is free. There is a microphone that uh, should be circulated. Uh, there will be no so much assistance, and so if there is a microphone, this should be circulated in, among the audience. And everybody is free, of course, to, to talk uh, and to interact uh, with us. Okay, let's start uh, with uh, Massimo Coco, who is the first. Thank you very much. I will try to contribute to this uh, debate uh, arising a couple of issues that, in my opinion, are crucial to discuss the role and the responsibilities of scientists in delivering science. So, as scientists, uh, we work for fundamental science. So, we mean that we work for monitoring, collecting data, understanding physical processes, and forecasting the special temporal patterns of these events. We therefore collaborate with many other scientists, for instance, engineers for earthquake and vulnerability, in order to apply the results of this science to compute to, to assess hazard vulnerability and for risk assessment. The goal, the expectation, is to pass these results to decision makers in order to promote mitigation policies, prevention actions, and disaster management. And at the end, we expect that these results arrive to society for outreach, education, preparedness, in, order, in, in summary, to increase the resilience to natural hazards. Many scientists believe that any contribution at the beginning of this chain spontaneously and automatically propagates through the society. And that is a big mistake, because the change is not continuous at all. And scientists must be aware that they work at the beginning of the chain, and they are only one of the key contributors to arrive to the end. I believe that this is the first general framework that we have account to discuss the communication of science. The second issue concerns a, a common framework, which is, uh, I believe that everybody agrees, that in order to reduce the earthquake vulnerability, I am, I am a seismologist, so I will speak of earthquakes. We need to improve awareness and preparation of society, as well as to undertake mitigation actions. And then we will agree that, that prevention is the mandatory long-term actions that must be put in place in order to reduce loss of lives and properties. And we all believe that the decision makers have to consider prevention and mitigation as a key role. In general, that is the framework which should represent the background for releases information to science concerning disasters, which means that prevention is uh, the main action to allow people to decide their own risk. And now, if we move from prevention to a warning, as scientists, we know very well that scientific research is, me is making relevant progress uh, in developing alert warning, including early warning and short-term forecast. But however, I believe that short-term forecast and warning can be effectively used by society only if prevention and long-term mitigation action are in place. And that is the second key message that I would like to raise. Being Italians, I cannot avoid to discuss of L'Aquila, because the L'Aquila earthquake represents uh, a lesson which, in my opinion, is still unheard by the scientists, by the decision maker, and by the, the population. 
you know very well uh, L'Aquila, and I will just uh, point out a few things. L'Aquila is a key, point, a key lesson because seismic hazard was loaned. It has been updated, the seismic hazard map in 2004. Vulnerability was low, known. Probability of occurrence was relatively high for Italy and was known. Historical seismicity and active strain measured by GPS networks clearly um, evidence the, the earthquake potential. And more important, these results were transferred to the National Civil Defense Agency, which together with scientists make an official law to the Italian government, including the new seismic hazard maps and the building code. And the vulnerability was also sent by the National Civil Defense to the decision makers, including the vulnerability of buildings in the L'Aquila town that collapsed during the earthquake. So risk information was formally transferred and delivered to decision makers. Which are the, impl the implications for that? Is that in the decades preceding the earthquakes, there was a very good synergy, a good action between science and decision makers. We had uh, and we have authoritative information concerning uh, seismicity evolution uh, released uh, to population and society. We have to admit uh, that outreach activities and preparedness of the society in Italy were and is still weak and rather poor. And resilience of society is scarce in Italy concerning earthquake. And this means that uh, the impact also of media of the climate prediction created, in my opinion, a misleading expectation from society. And if we come back to the issue from prevention to short-term action for, for our uh, mitigation, this will uh, uh, make the point. In concluding, I have also to, to point out that, as you know, in August 2009, they start a prosecution. And several Italian scientists, not all governmental officials, were, are nowadays under investigations for this. And we have to look to conclude that the prosecutors of family says that uh, the prosecution has nothing to do with the prediction, but everything, everything to do with the failure of government appointment scientists to evaluate and communicate the potential risk of local evaluation. I believe that uh, the lesson of, from this earthquake are still not fully considered, and I believe that this is uh, our goal, our duty, to open a, a clear discussions because uh, during L'Aquila there, the, there was the presumption of doing in few days or weeks uh, what uh, it, has not, it was not done in the decades before the earthquakes. Thank you. Okay. Um, I would like to touch the point of um, uncertainty when we are dealing with forecasts, warnings, risk assessments, and scenarios. Okay, I, I think that there is a whole spectrum of uncertain situations. On the one hand, we have something like, I, call, I would like to call it mild uncertainty, so we can predict with a decent uh, reliability. But on the other hand, we have something, I would like to call it wild uncertainty. So there are clearly situations, in my point of view, that are not predictable. And uh, being a hydrologist and working with uh, river floods, yeah, I try to locate a few of the things we are doing here. For example, estimating the building uh, damage to, flooded, to a flooded uh, city. I would say, yes, this is predictable with uh, some kind of uncertainty. Much more difficult, for example, climate change effects on, on floods. But then I think there are issues that are close to wild uncertainty or are maybe wild uncertainty. They are not predictable. For example, like um, uh, higher order effects. So uh, the connectivity of uh, different compartments across space and time. So a large disaster leading to business interruption and economic turmoil in a completely distant area. So this is, uh, so to say, the framework. And uh, now, 
one example um, from, own, from my own work, and it's, it was a bad result, but it's my own work, so I can show it. Um, here you see our estimations of the 100-year damage aggregated for a number of communities. Okay, and uh, this is the median, and this is our uncertainty range, 95% and 99%. And, and then this is the reported flood damage. Um, and what you see here is, yeah, there is almost no skill. Um, there were a few communities where we were doing quite well, but there were communities we estimated uh, half a million of direct damage, and it turned out to be 12, above 12 million. And this is still in the area of mild uncertainty. So we are improving on that, don't worry. <laughs> Uh, but the other issue I would like to, to make is that we tend to be overconfident. We think we do no more than we actually do. There have been some, some systematic experiments on that. People have been asked to give an estimate. Many people have been asked. And then you can calculate the true uncertainty of this sample. And in addition, the people have been asked about their uncertainty, how close they think their estimate is to the truth. And this is the kind of result you get. The true uncertainty is much larger than the subjective uncertainty. So it has been shown in systematic experiments that we think we are more, more knowledgeable than we actually are. OK, and this is my last slide um, for, for, for uh, here, this discussion. I think. Um, we are moving in this direction. Complexity is increasing. There is much more connectivity between regions, between time scales and, and different sectors. We have the problem of overconfidence and the problem of validation. Usually I do not have data to validate my 1,000 year event. And another issue, we as geoscientists work mainly in this area, I think, where we have uh, more or less mild uncertainty, but maybe the most potential disasters or, or most difficult situations will occur uh, in the area of wild uncertainty where natural, human, and technological systems interact. So, and from this, I, I have two questions for you to answer. Yeah, do we know the limits of our uncertainty? Have we, do we have a map where our limits are? And we as geoscientists, are we working on the right uh, issues, on the important issues? And how can we organize the work on the really difficult issues? Thank you. Well, good morning or good afternoon, depending on how you see it. My name is Peter Billing. Uh, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a geoscientist. I'm a simple administrator. And, uh, well, I'm running the Monitoring and Information Center in the European Commission. It's the European Civil Protection Mechanism. And I'll give you a few ideas on what we are doing, how we are doing it. And I will also ask you a few questions and give you a few uh, challenges uh, in, in that respect. Well, the European Civil Protection Mechanism, we cover prevention, preparedness and response. It's a cooperation mechanism to facilitate the response in particular and the provision of assistance in the civil protection area in case of major natural but also man-made disasters. <laughs> and we are operating both inside and outside the EU. We are actually one arm in the response capacity of the European Union, the other arm is humanitarian assistance, which is present in 50 countries, mainly developing countries, with a huge budget, it's about 1 billion euros per year, but we are the smaller arm of that, of that entity. Uh, it encompasses uh, the Commission, the European Commission, and 32 participating states the 27 EU member states and five 
non-members, Croatia, Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway, and since uh, last year also the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. So it's a, a network, uh, a European network. The key hub within the network is the MIG, the Monitoring and Information Center, uh, which I, I lead and which is the, uh, the tool to respond uh, properly to uh, emergencies. One of the mandates we have is also to develop detection and warning systems, and we have been quite active in several fields uh, in a multi-hazard approach. And I give you a few examples in the uh, following slides. Uh, also, I can say we have made a few success stories in the last years, one of them being GDAX, the Global Disaster Alert and Coordination System, uh, which pr provides multi-hazard alerts, including on tsunamis, earthquakes, and many others. And it has actually, at this moment, 18,000 users, mostly disaster management managers across the world. So this is where all the scientific information comes together and is channeled in a relatively simple uh, way to, to decision makers. Then other, other aspects or other aspects that we, that we uh, cover is uh, fires, fire forecasting, fire risk forecasting through the European Forest Fire Information System, EFIS. We work together with the meteorological agencies uh, through Meteor Alarm, and we are also looking at floods through the European Flood Alert System. I should say it's a, at a relatively high level. We are not interested in the small floods which can be dealt with by the member states themselves or even at regional level. We are interested in the major disasters and therefore we need to have these tools in place and we need to also have a global view on all kinds of hazards and at all regions worldwide. Now, obviously there are a number of challenges and I will put forward a few questions also to you, to the audience here, to the geoscientists. I would group the, the challenges in, in three areas. The first area is obviously the scientific challenges. So how can the methodologies be further improved? The methods, how can, uh, let's say, the, the warning times being, be reduced? I mean, there is already a lot of progress made. When I started in, in this area, in this field, uh, we knew about major earthquakes worldwide maybe in an hour or two after the event. Now everything is available within minutes, so there are important uh, improvements, but still uh, there's an area of uncertainty. There's, well, less false alerts now, but still uh, there are, and there will always be. They cannot uh, be entirely reduced, but I think we should try to really limit them, to narrow them down to uh, an acceptable level. Obviously, it's better to overreact than to underreact, but we need to be able to have uh, the best possible scientific knowledge. And if I walk around here through this, I must say, really impressive event, uh, I realize that uh, very, very little from the knowledge that you all acquire and you build up is actually reaching my level or our level at the emergency management uh, sector. So there is also then challenges in terms of operational challenges. I mean, how, for example, can we translate the wealth of scientific knowledge and information into operational language and procedures? And we have seen in, in uh, the previous uh, speaker from Italy that this in itself provides uh, important risks. I mean, do you underreact or do you overreact? Do you react in the right way? This is not an easy, not an easy task, I can sell, say. And then finally at the political level, I mean, it's probably not surprising that I talk also about the political level, the European Commission being a political institution, there are a number of challenges. Uh, for example, well, how can you reach decision makers? How can you convince them to invest more in prevention and preparedness? This is always difficult to sell because if nothing happens, means prevention has worked out, why should I invest? So politicians like to be seen as proactive and they, they are the disaster managers, they are on the dikes of the floods and so on, but prevention is important and we have seen it, we have seen it a few weeks ago in Indonesia 
where actually there was a big difference to be seen from the situation in 2004, where there were no warning in place, no warning system in place, and now there was this uh, tsunami warning system in place. People have been evacuated or have evacuated themselves. So uh, quite interesting uh, difference and worthwhile to investigate a little bit further. What are the lessons? What can be still improved? So this is one very important political challenge and how can this actually be achieved? And then last point in my presentation, uh, it's not only about reaching the decision makers, but also uh, the people, the populations. So the, this famous last mile issue. And there I think uh, the geoscientists can also make a, an important contribution, but not alone. They need to be uh, sort of an interaction between a multi, multi-sectoral interaction between decision makers, between the scientists and, and uh, let's say, sociologists, uh, communication specialists, how can this actually be addressed in the right way in order to reach out to the population so that everybody is well informed and can actually act in the appropriate manner. That's all for the moment. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward also to your questions. Thanks, Peter. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, represent another sector, another market here, that is the, the insurance market. And we, as an insurance market, depend very largely on, on things you do, on your products, because that is what we, we work with, that is risk and understanding risk, and, and I'll come to that in a second. But um, in order to, and you heard a lot about uh, communication, in order to enhance communication, what we've done recently, we've created this, this network, this so-called Willis Research Network, which is the largest currently existing network, essentially between science and finance. And the idea is to really enhance understanding, and I think I have, yes, um, identify, evaluate, and minimize, as well as share the cost of natural and man-made hazard. Increase the penetration of insurance around the world, and I can tell you that in many countries, in many developing countries, insurance currently is far less than a percent. So there's a lot to go, and frankly, there's also quite a bit of money around the world if we understand the risk to go into those areas, and hence resilience of developed and developing countries. Our value chain, our value creation is, is shown here. It's relatively easy. It's uh, discover risk, quantify risk, control, finance it. But you see how much risk is essentially in the foreground here and how important it is for us to understand and quantify risk. And if we don't do that in the right order, we actually destroy our values. And the uncertainty of the insurance business is obvious. At the beginning of a year, we don't know whether we will have a loss or not. And so in order to get that right, to get the product right, to get the price right, and most importantly, get the capital right, we have to model it, and we need you to do that better. There's one point I want to bring up, and that is quite important for us, because in some ways, it seems to always, after an event, mess us up in a way, create fear, create uncertainty, rather than the opposite. So what we see is whenever there is a big event like the event in Tohoku, and yes, we haven't understood a lot, and yes, we haven't uh, modeled tsunamis before, and yes, this is a very big event, but it's not the biggest event in this world. And now suddenly people are running around, uh, great scientists, and I love him to bits, Ross Stein from the USGS, talking now about potential earthquakes that link northern part and southern part of California, things we had thought before is impossible. And with that, more and more, you know, make emphasis, put emphasis on the tail end of the risk. A challenge with that, and you've, we've seen it in Katrina, suddenly the mega typhoons were everywhere. Um, by the way, the cost of evacuation until 2005 was exceeding the losses from hurricanes. And then there's climate change and everything is getting worse. Now, this, this discussion about maximum possible to maximum probable loss is a very important one for us. And 
One simple reason for that is that whenever there is a huge tail, and the tail is much bigger, we need more capital because of regulator and rating agencies, <laughs> which means that the business is becoming non-profitable. Because we can't, and whatever you think, you know, we can't easily increase the premium. No, we can't. And it's not only because of regulation, it's because of competition and many other things. So we need just more capital. We need to return a lot of that value to our shareholders so the shareholders take out their capital because it's no longer profitable. So by talking up the risk, you destroy essentially our market. I think this is a very, very important message. We have to be careful what we say. So it's rather than the opposite, by increasing awareness, we create markets. No, we need to understand the risk. That's very important, but don't talk it up. So the public-private academic, a word which is, by the way, uh, created recently in Washington, where NASA, USGS, uh, FEMA, and the financial world came together to discuss solutions for the future. So the public-private academic partnership for risk identification, assessment, sharing, be objective, and by all means, let's try to minimize cost. Thanks a lot for that. Thank you very much. Now it's time for the great debate. I thank the panelists for this brief introduction, of course, it's the basis for the discussion, but it's not omnicomprehensive at all. And uh, now the floor is uh, to you, and uh, I'm asking if there is questions or comments or uh, topics to, to raise. Please. I, I, I was hoping perhaps one of you uh, guys me, might can want you, to expand Excuse on. me, excuse me, because we are web streaming. Can you qualify yourself, tell oh, I, your I'm, name? I'm Seth Stein from Northwestern University. Uh, relative to Giro's last point, I think it's important to remember that if we, if we overestimate hazards and risks enormously, we're not, it's not just the insurance companies that we're damaging. We're damaging all of society as a whole if we overestimate risks and divert resources from other applications. So it's, it's even a bigger problem than just the insurance companies. So it's important that we neither overestimate risks nor underestimate them. And I, you know, maybe, I think that's something that probably needs, you know, to, th to kind of think about and even per e fight taking your point and maybe even expanding further on it. Thanks. Gero, do you like to? Well, I, I can comment. I, I, I totally agree. Although I think, you know, this goes very much to others in the round here, this, this question, because it, it's more than surely insurance. I think there, there is a huge issue always because we look into the long term, largely with science, and the near term might look very different. You know, think about the Tohoku earthquake, which was probably a one in 1,000 event, had a certain loss, but the much more important earthquake that could happen directly in, in Tokyo would probably not be a tsunami event. So the, the likelihood of that is much larger, which essentially means, should we really now put a lot of money in tsunami or where? It's very, very difficult to assess because there's this short-term need that comes up with the events and this long-term need we're really looking into with the science. Yeah. <coughs> okay. First here and then there. Okay. My name is uh, Friedemann Wenzler from Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, and I have, it's a question, but also a comment what, uh, to what Peter Billing was saying. And it refers to the problem of transferring scientific knowledge, also Massimo was talking about that, to, let's say, civil protection in this case. And uh, one, one comment I would like to make, you had arrows only one direction. I think the key thing is also having kind of a pointing yeah. thing in, in the other direction. But the problem is a little bit different. In, in Gero's case, you introducing science in your concept is, gives you a competitive edge compared to your competitors. So it's a direct motivation. In case of a company where the, the notion of the last mile is coming from, I think it was communication industry, it's a very direct motivation to cast science into a profit in this case, right? Now, the question to me is whether we have similar motivations for transferring scientific knowledge in, in the hazard and risk area to civil protection, let's say. And I don't see it that easily because in the end, our measure as a scientist, our measure of success is really publication and, and, and other things, not really the transfer in the first place. So I think we have to, to think a little bit more about uh, 
you know, let's say partnerships, uh, communities of trust or, or other models which are not simply copied from industry. We can learn a lot from industry, but I think we can simply copy that. And there's probably a, good, a number of good examples. I know L'Aquila may not be the uh, best case for that, but uh, that's what's a big shake out if I think US and Switzerland is doing something same. There's, there's probably many examples, but I think we have to create this uh, kind of partnerships which are really on, on equal level in a way, and also this good case examples where we learn that it's worthwhile doing that. There's also benefit coming from this side. But it's not coming automatically or by itself because the primary motivation, I think, is not given. Thank you. Yeah. No, no, first, first, first Peter and then yeah. Massimo. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for, for, this, for this intervention. It's indeed uh, true what you're saying. Uh, I see from, from the perspective of my daily work, uh, there's a big gap indeed between what we are doing and what we are supposed to do, what we are supposed to deliver on, and the actual knowledge that is behind that. And that is actually a risk. And that is a risk we need to reduce. And one of the methods to do that is actually to have a closer dialogue between decision makers and scientists on the one hand, but also involving other societal players, be it, be it industry or be it uh, whatever societal representatives. This is a very important gap that we see and that is dangerous. It's dangerous in, in one direction and in another, I mean overreaction, overestimating the risk and underestimating the risk. And maybe also a comment to the previous uh, speaker or intervention here. Obviously, governments, I mean, I'm not talking as a government because I'm representative of an international organization, but governments have to take also decisions on what is the acceptable risk. Uh, I mean, a total protection is not possible. And any finance minister will say, hey, are we spending two billion on establishing a higher dike when the Likelihood of a dike break is, I think, one in 100,000 or whatever years. Or are we investing that in education in a general way, in the schools, in kindergartens and whatever? And this discussion is a very important discussion. And I'm sure the schools and the universities will win because it makes sense. It's a potential risk. So there needs to be also a communication with the population and an information saying, OK, these are the realistic risks and this is what we can do, what we as a government can provide you with. Everything else is residual risks and we have to agree amongst ourselves that, well, we cannot cover that, at least not with this and this uh, policy. So this is a very important element that needs to be discussed at society level between politicians, scientists and the population. Thank you very much. Please. Yeah. I, I agree with you, but I also believe that for the tasks of the discussion, I believe that the problem is this direction, not the opposite. Because we are discussing how scientists communicate science. So independently of L'Aquila, and I apologize because for me it's emotionally proving speaking about L'Aquila, you have maybe felt before. I believe that partnership, cooperation is important. But they are still polarized toward the scientists. And to discuss with the decision makers, you need protocols, and they need authoritative information. So they cannot select among thousands of papers which is authoritative. They need recognized, identified people in charge who take the responsibilities to deliver the information and to assess the hazard, the vulnerability, and the risk, which make the difference between the silver bullet prediction of a scientist that put on a website a forecasting or a prediction and an action which is targeted to the decision makers. So we need protocols and we need procedures. The L'Aquila is a paradox because this arrived to the local authorities who simply did not take into account the information of vulnerability even the few hours or days before the earthquake. And last comment, there was a clear problem with the society, as he was clearly pointing out, because I believe that the citizens must recognize that the, the first preliminary information that they need to know to decide if evacuating or not a building as responding to the panic is to know how their house will receive to the shaking. 
not if somebody is authoritative or not to release a, a short-term warning. That is the first, and this is exactly what was missing in L'Aguila. Okay, let's take two more questions from the floor. The first there, the second here, and then Giro and Bruno. Please. Uh, can uh, right can you speak louder uh, or change microphone because we cannot hear from oh, yeah. okay. I'm Yamauchi and uh, uh, working on the uh, uh, Fukushima uh, radioactive contamination problem right now. And then, uh, the all, uh, particularly the last two speakers that uh, mentioned, or actually all speakers mentioned that the predictable natural di disaster. But actually, the radioactive uh, contamination problem is a geoscience problem, but it is not predict predictable. And then, it, once it happens, general public really wanted to have where the radioactive uh, material are floating right now. And those viewpoints that I didn't hear anything, any comment from the last two speakers that if it is unpredictable, such kind of thing, the, then if suddenly such, uh, such kind of big thing happened, how uh, we should uh, inform the uh, warning and how we should inform the current situation? Uh, such, does it such kind of protocol? That's my question. And the second thing is that uh, for, the, uh, for working on such kind of uh, radioactive stuff, actually, the, it is very difficult right now for the young scientists to pop in, just because they are funded for the, their own research. But the, although this is a, a geoscience problem, and then it, uh, the, there's no such kind of scientific community exist right now. So it, whenever the problem happens, it, then the people who are working from the different uh, discipline have to help it. I'm a space scientist, but still I can do it. Such kind of uh, the viewpoint that uh, does any uh, uh, the prediction, prediction people have such kind of uh, allowance for the young scientists. If such, such kind of thing happens, if the young scientists want to pop into the national disaster and then uh, predict uh, their own risk. Thank you. Here. My name is Uwe Ulbrich from Freie Universität Berlin. Well, we are discussing this from a geoscientist point of view, which is quite natural and I like. Uh, the sequence that Bruno Merz showed, this is our view how things should work and he clearly pointed out it does not. Now, there are the scientists involved in this warning process, in the communication process, and what we see these days is that security research, even that funded by the European Union, has become largely detached from what we as geoscientists are doing. So we have two lines of research which are separate from each other, and I think this is a big mistake. And it is not only the responsibility of people like the European Union to change that, but it is also us as geoscientists to start and to wish to start collaboration of our results with the help of social scientists. Because there is a little truth in what social scientists say. There is no such thing as natural catastrophes. There is only social catastrophes. Thank you. Thank you. Gero now, then Bruno. Uh, any other questions? Questions for, okay, then. Uh, let me take one there, others, so let's take that. Two, okay. Gero? Okay, there, there were many questions. I don't want to, to answer all of them, but, but I think there is, there, there's of course predictability is, is what is predictable, how do we communicate that, how do we work together. But uh, where it really comes from then, or comes to, is where are the incentives. So, so why should a scientist take the risk and talk to others and, and really come to us and make a statement which could be wrong? I think we need to increase these, these incentives. And I think the challenge with increasing these incentives is that, you know, if you just publish and this is the major part, it will not necessarily work. So the one simple you know, solution for that was what, what we created, this, as well as the research network, where essentially, and I put it very straight and, and, and blunt, money is in, and so scientists come in because they see there is the insurance they can fund. But they may, they are, there need to be more incentives to do that, and I think that's what we're currently really missing. Bruno? Yeah, 
I would like to follow up on this. I mean, um, yes, it has been said, or usually it's, it's um, we, we say prevention pays, but uh, this is not the case in any situation. So this is the question of acceptable risk and the question of how safe is safe enough. And then also what, what Uwe Ulbrich said, that, that uh, in a way we get detached from, from other important strands of research. And I think this nicely comes together in, in uh, Friedemann's statement that we need transdisciplinary research. And uh, uh, this is difficult. I mean, for me as hydrologist, it's much more, much, uh, much simpler to look at a hydrological process and to publish. And it's very difficult to talk to economists, to socialists, to psychologists, to urban planners, and to, to get decent results. So, so I think this is a core problem. <laughs> okay, two more comments or questions from the floor. Please. Yeah, my name is uh, Tom Pagano, and I was a river forecaster in the US, but also a research scientist in Australia. And my question is about how operational services are related to the role and responsibilities of geoscientists. Um, maybe when you look at meteorology, there's very strong operational weather forecasting services, but also academics are expected to produce forecasts and interact with users. In hydrology, the case is that maybe the liability is too great that you don't want to confuse the message that you have the official forecasters being the only people that speak. But then also you have climate where maybe there isn't any kind of operational service, but they expect academics to go out and interact with users. I guess the question is, well, which, which is it? Is it if the information is important enough to get to the users, they should operationalize it? Or should you always expect users to go out and um, you know, interact directly with geoscientists? Thank you. Second comment. Uh, Bruce? Here. Here, here. Later. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bruce Malaman from King's College London. My comments about uncertainty, which uh, Bruno Mertz showed in his graphic, you know, very clearly uncertainty involved. And I think part of our role as geoscientists, which sometimes we don't do, is really to convey the uncertainty on our estimates. And this sort of plays into what Garrow was saying, which was we're overestimating things or we're underestimating things. Well, maybe we're not overestimating them. We're just not putting the uncertainties on what we're estimating or that's not actually being conveyed to the appropriate people. Thank you. Now, Peter. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me come back to two aspects uh, that were mentioned earlier on. Um, one is related to the acceptable risk, and I would say the, the other side of that coin is the costs. Giro had mentioned that also in his last slide, at minimal cost. So it's also important, and this is what we, what we try to achieve at the European level, it's important to discuss what are the costs for our response systems. And we think that there are gains to be made through cooperation between European member states. You can argue, for example, does every country have to have 10 search and rescue teams? Or is it perhaps enough that they have nine and they share one commonly across Europe? We're trying to experiment with these kinds of uh, ideas and we have made quite interesting uh, experience in the last years, for example, with sharing forest fire uh, airplanes. If you calculate it at national level, every country has to spend, well, say, 20 million for an aircraft. It may perhaps be better to buy two and to share them at European level. We're trying to convince member states to go into this direction, but it's a very difficult discussion. You will not be surprised to hear about that. Then the other question I wanted to relate to is uh, how do we make sure that we have this, this link. And this get, goes back to what in, was in one of the slides, I think, uh, of uh, Bruno Merz. The applied science, the way we operate or we try to establish our, our activities is from the, let's say, the level of the crisis center. We have a relationship, an established relationship with the Commission Joint Research Center, which is our, what you would call, scientific back office that translates 
the scientific knowledge which is around in Europe and, and worldwide into something we can actually handle. So there are mechanisms, mechanisms in place. They are not yet very well established. We need to be a bit more proactive on that and to have a better outreach, uh, perhaps also to other players like industry. There are discussions about public-private partnerships and so on. But there is certainly uh, some way to go and uh, we'll work on that and we are actually working on that. Perhaps a last element, I think it was from the, the colleague in, in the back there on uh, the society, there's another aspect which needs to be looked at uh, and this also relates to cost. The, the element of volunteers, for example, there are plenty of volunteers in, in many member states that are trained. I mean, I'm not talking about the Red Cross system, but there's in many countries, Italy has a lot of volunteers. Germany through the THW, a lot of volunteers. This is also an asset which you can get, I mean, if you put it in, in economic terms, at relatively low cost. And that uh, reinforces the overall resilience of the societies. If we want to put the societies in the pictures, I think the volunteer aspect is one of the roads that we need to go down. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so other people uh, here first? I like also to stress that, uh, I mean, there are not only questions that we like to have from the floor, but even answers. I mean, we are accidentally on this, on this, uh, on the stage, but uh, uh, this happened in a sense just by chance. We could have, have sitting just w uh, where you are, and other people from you could have been here because it's just an open discussion among us. Okay, so first there, no, sorry, first, first Giorgio here first, and then there. Here, here. No, no, please, f f follow, follow my instructions. So first here and then there. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, Giorgio Boni, Cima Research Foundation, Italy. Uh, I, I would like to, to raise uh, a question about, uh, mm, about a, a little uh, different thing. Because uh, we geoscientists often talk about um, Study something new, so, so, uh, studying what we uh, what we don't know. We talk about uncertainty, how to know more, how to increase knowledge. But from my experience, uh, I know that we have a sort of little treasure or consolidated knowledge that is not uh, shared with decision makers and people and people. So I would like to discuss uh, to raise a discussion about what. This is the role of the geoscientist in, in increasing this sharing of the consolidated knowledge that can be useful for decision makers and people to reduce the uh, risk, disaster of risk. What, what, uh, what's the, our role and our responsibility in doing that? I know it's less interesting than doing new research, but this, I think, it can give sense to our, to our job, more sense to our job. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now there. Yeah. Hi, I'm Emma Patu. I'm a doctoral student from East Tennessee State University, and I specialize in public health. Um, my point is along the same lines. Um, is it possible for geoscientists to communicate risk at the community level and hold community forums, is that possible? Um, also, maybe this could have av av averted the LACALA event. Um, so I pose this question, is it possible to hold community forums so you can begin starting this interdisciplinary communication? Okay. Yeah, I, 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 w I wish to provide an answer, and this answer also is a comment uh, to previous uh, uh, questions concerning uh, the multidisciplinary skills uh, that we have to involve uh, in the decision chain. First, I, I believe that uh, scientists must keep their results and their science open. Also the background, they should be open. We must be more prepared to communicate our results, and, and, and not only in terms of the communication details, but also for the tools that we use. The second one is that when we move from the results of a single discipline, which is earthquake hazard, for instance, or vulnerability assessment, and we move to the decision maker, to the society, 
we need to involve other, other people. And we need to learn how to discuss and speak with other scientists. I have a personal experience on uh, an initiative promoted by the NERC, by the two research councils in UK, the social science and the environmental science. And we spent one day only to clarify our definition of resilience between physical scientists and social scientists. But these efforts are needed because otherwise we will never construct this uh, cross-contamination of vision that exactly address what was raised before. The second comment is concerning communication. We are now, geoscientists has to be aware, as all the scientists, that we are facing a new era. The ICT revolution, the social network, the new, the new communication tools, which are completely changing the way in which we can communicate results and at the same time make much more difficult to distinguish which is authoritative or not. And this requires not only a debate, this requires a lot of efforts in understanding how to do this. So I fully agree with you, but this again, for the coming, coming back and concluding for the L'Aquila, many of the results were available on the website of the institutions involved in the monitoring. Everything was there. The problem is that the society was not prepared to use this information. And any information that you receive, that you release during the, the short time preceding, during the panic period, it will increase the, 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 the panic. And then in that moment, if you are not prepared, you have to find a difficult balance for avoiding creating further panic, but to release information, which is a very difficult equilibrium if you do not work during peacetime. But for the future, we have to understand that we are facing a revolution, the digital era, which is not only written on the document of the European Commission for funding ICT projects. It's our work which will change, and the future is the future of data scientists that we still don't have. Thank you very much. Other comments? So I take a question or comment there, and the second here. Please. Hello, my name is Charlotte Sederbom. I work at the Swedish Geotechnical Institute, and that's a research institute that is really doing both. We do applied research and we try to implement it in society. And I agree with many things that have come up here. I mean, we have problems, even though that's our main aim to actually do this. But I would like to lift to the, to the scientific community that you should really, in the evalua evaluation criteria, don't only look at the possibility or the, how, how good you are to, to publish in, in research publications, but also how you outreach it. And when you start a project that you really um, look at who are you aiming for, who will get these results. There are so many big international um, collaboration projects and they end up with lots of good reports and big web portals, but who is reading it? Are you really reaching the people that should get it? And the last thing, I mean, communication to the policymakers, it's really about economics. And today, sometimes we transfer risks or uncertainties into costs in monetary terms, but of, often most only the primary consequences. And we have not yet reached the possibility or been able to get secondary consequences which might be the reason for why you see, um, why, why you underestimate the costs, because often the costs are the primary effects and the primary consequences and not the secondary ones that is actually reported in when you've had a big accident or a catastrophe. Thanks. Thank you. Here. Yeah. Um, my name is Ian Lambert from Australia. I'm the um, Secretary General of the 34th IGC, but I also work for Geoscience Australia, which is a national survey. Um, I'd just like to make a couple of comments on how we have approached the, uh, the uh, interface between science and government in Australia, which I think we've done uh, with considerable success. We've, uh, through our National Committee of Earth Sciences, um, uh, some years ago, made a presentation to the Prime Minister and Cabinet, and as an outcome of that, uh, we now have very good regular contact in, into government. Uh, funding has come for many of the initiatives that we do. We have very uh, significant initiatives, not only in Australia, but in, in Southeast uh, Asia. Um, we've also uh, succeeded to a large degree in separating the, the focus on publishing from 
the focus on the impacts of research. And uh, so we have people who have, uh, have risen to, to, to high levels, both in uh, academic and uh, government agencies, on the, on the impact of their work without necessarily having high numbers of publications, which can distort the outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. If you don't mind, I will stop here, not the, the, not the event, but just taking comments from the floor, because five minutes are still missing, and I'd like to ask the panelists here to make one or two minutes each of conclusion of this debate. Can you, who will start? Who will, no, let, let's follow the same order that we had at the beginning. So Massimo first. Yeah, I, I, was, I wish just to, to add uh, the comment that uh, we we need to do a lot of work in order to face this challenge because uh, even if uh, the, the experience for us, I like the, the comment from the Australian experience because I believe that uh, assessing the impact of our research is something that has to be done to evaluate how the, uh, the, the society receive it. And this is something that uh, at least uh, in my country, but I would say in Europe, uh, is not very well uh, evolved. And the other comment is that, uh, for, instance, for instance, in health, if I remember, there was somebody before they working in the health field. In the health, they have a more direct uh, contact with, uh, with, with society with respect to the earthquakes. But if you look on the journals that in which the scientists publish, they use open access much more than geoscientists. And we are here discussing how to reach the society, but we are rushing to publish on the impact factor more than open access. And then we have to be honest with ourselves when our career is important and when our communication desire is important. Bruno? Hey. Um, yeah, to be honest is a good point. <laughs> yeah, I think we need to be honest uh, and to be the, the honest broker to tell what we know and to tell what we do not know. Uh, as Bruce, as you said, uh, tag the uncertainties to, to, to our estimates. And then I think, uh, yeah, this will be a never-ending story, the, the effort to, to establish a risk communication uh, in, in society. Okay. Peter? Well, that, <clears throat> that's actually not much to add. I mean, from my perspective, uh, the debate showed two things. One, uh, there are success stories, clearly, on which we can further build. We have made progress altogether. But secondly, there's also still a long way to go. And the second part of my conclusion from this discussion is we need to increase the dialogue, the dialogue between the different stakeholders. I think this is an important gap that we can identify and as a result from this, from this discussion. Well, I, I do agree. I, I just see with all that that because the amount of data is increasing steadily, because the you know, scientists have to go deeper and deeper into what they do, they become more and more specialists, and what we need is more generalists. So in some ways we need these brokers that sit in between the different disciplines in science, that sit in between science and politics. And frankly, I think we need to create a new species here, a species of generalists that are able, capable, and also want to go in between and be the brokers between all these disciplines. And this is a problem of the educational system that should be changed. Okay, thank you very much, Charlotte. You, will you come to here so we conclude together? So I thank you all for this participation. It was very, very interesting my side. This is probably the first uh, example of great debate on this topic, at least in the few years within the EGU. Uh, I hope that this can be repeated in the next years. Of course, a one hour of debate on such a complicated matter doesn't solve anything, but at least uh, we openly in an assembly say what we think. Uh, and probably next time we should also invite, uh, if we repeat this experiment, people from media, because it's a part of this channel and uh, not the only one, but it's a part of the channel. And the media, it's not only the press, but also the web, uh, that it's the other very important part of the channel where the, 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 the information can be conveyed immediately worldwide uh, without, very likely, uh, without any insurance of quality and then can create confusion 
in addition to be informative. So I will plot to you first of all and to the panels and this concludes uh, the event. Thank you very much.